It's good to be back. Um, and before I start my sermon, I want to express my gratitude to the members of this congregation who took my preaching practicum class last spring and so ably, I hear, delivered sermons during the month of July. Weren't they, weren't they great? Yeah. <laughs> When I was growing up, my brother had a pet box turtle, a miserable creature that lived its life inside a terrarium. How I pitied this turtle. Sometimes on hot summer days, as an act of compassion, I'd take the turtle on walks. What I'd, what I'd actually do is carry it outside to the yard and sit in a lawn chair and read a book while the turtle slowly emerged from its shell and tried its best to escape. But when the turtle got close to the edge of the yard, I'd get up, put down my book, carry it back to the center of the yard, sit down, pick up my book again, and we would repeat the process. Poor turtle. This pet of ours had a different essence than our family's dog who chased sticks and retrieved balls, or our family's cats who could be coaxed into playing with string, or even later on my brother's pet ferret who joyfully ran through cardboard tubes. No, the turtle was different. The, the turtle was like the fish in our fish tank and like our ducks. I'm sharing too much here about my childhood. The turtle could only react, it couldn't interact, it couldn't play, it just acted out of its base appetites. A thing that separates our mammalian family members from any non-mammalian household residents is the capacity for play. Later I'd learn that play, far from being something trivial and unimportant, is actually something that confers an evolutionary advantage. Reptiles can only act out of a narrow set of motivations, can only act on urges to feed, fight, flee, reproduce. But for society to function, we need to be able to behave in other ways. Play, it turns out, is absolutely essential to the functioning of complex social orders. I know I was onto something with this topic when after choosing play as the sermon topic this morning, I looked at the website of the Unitarian Universalist World magazine and saw that the feature story of the summertime was a piece on the wisdom of play by UU minister Anthony McCarr, who serves our large congregation down in Atlanta. Reverend McCarr confirms this point about the evolutionary benefits of play. He writes, what's amazing is how evolution, which is as practical and ruthless as you can get, seems to love playfulness. Makar explains it's because play develops your mind and keeps it sharp. It's because play can provide safe outlets for releasing aggressive impulses. It's because play teaches kids how to regulate fear and anger. We play, he says, because play teaches people how to take turns, which is nothing less than the basis for civilization. We play, he writes, because it gives people the opportunity to connect and socialize. We play because it energizes the imagination and can open doors to new insights and connections. So contrast his affirmation of the benefits of play with this observation by family therapist Edwin Friedman about what happens when we lose our playfulness. Friedman writes, playfulness is an attribute that originally evolved with mammals and is an ingredient in both intimacy and the ability to maintain distance. You can, after all, play with your pet cat, horse, or dog, but it's absolutely impossible to develop a playful relationship with a reptile, whether it is your pet salamander, no matter how cute, or your pet turtle, snake, or alligator. Side note, I don't know what sorts of people um, he's talking to who have a pet alligator, but I assume that Friedman knows. These animals, he says, are deadly serious creatures. Friedman continues, Chronically anxious families, anxious institutions, anxious churches, and even anxious societies tend to mimic reptilian behavior. 
Lacking the capacity to be playful, their perspective is narrow. Lacking perspective, their repertoire of responses is thin. Neither apology nor forgiveness is within their ken. When they try to work things out, their meetings wind up as storming sessions. Indeed, in any family or organization, seriousness is so commonly an attribute of the most anxious and most difficult members that they can quite appropriately be considered to be functioning out of reptilian regression. Friedman concludes, the relationship between anxiety and seriousness is so predictable that the absence of playfulness in any institution is almost always a clue to the degree of its emotional regression. So let me tell a story that I think perfectly illustrates the point Friedman is making. At my last church, there was an issue that came up before the board where there was deep disagreement. Some members supported one path, others supported another. The sides grew entrenched. In the meeting at which we discussed this issue, the conversation became ideologically and emotionally gridlocked. Anxiety flooded the room and the reptilian responses came out. Some fought. Words got short and nasty, voices rose, tempers flared, and others fled, signaling that they were pulling away emotionally by pulling away physically, leaning back in their chairs, inching towards the door. The issue was tabled until the next month. As the next month's board meeting approached, I dreaded it. Just thinking about it gave me a knot in my stomach. And the custom at that church was for the minister to begin each board meeting with kind of a spiritual moment. I obsessed over what I ought to say at the beginning of that meeting. I thought about offering a prayer, subtly recalling ourselves to, to our best selves. Dear God, please don't let us be jerks to each other again. <laughs> I seriously thought about yelling, about chewing them out, telling them all how miserable the last board meeting had been and telling them that they better behave themselves this month. Fortunately, I decided to try a different approach. As we entered the room that evening, things were tense before the meeting even started. People had come ready to fight. I lit the chalice and I invited the members of that board to play a game. I made a silly gesture and invited everyone else to mimic that silly gesture in an exaggerated way. Your turn. <laughs> and then I went to the board member on the side and I said, your turn, you make a silly gesture. Do we have any? I, saw, I saw Bill Rhodes sneak in. Bill, do you want to give us a silly gesture? <laughs> oh, oh, look at that, all right. so. And around and around the room we get. I've got to ask one more. Bill Petit, I see you're a board member. You want to, you want to, give, us a silly, you want to give us a silly gesture here? Oh, look at that. Oh. Oh, all right. We went around the table like that, each board member getting a chance to make a silly gesture, all the other members having to pay attention and copy. Here's what happened. As we went around the room at the board meeting, the person who came in with her arms crossed tensely decided to pat her head and rub her belly. The person sitting already halfway out the door did disco dance moves. People smiled, a few even laughed. We started that meeting with our mammalian brains reactivated and our reptilian fighting, flighting brains suppressed. We tackled the issue before us. We didn't all agree, but we spoke respectfully, listened fully and non-defensively. We stayed at the table. We got through it. That's the power of play. So far this morning, I've talked about the anthropology of play and the psychology of play, but I also want to talk a bit about the theology of play. I remember when I was in college, I was taking a humanities course on ancient Greece and, and our conference, our, our small discussion group of about a dozen students. Um, we had a guest professor come and meet with just us. Uh, the professor was a retired professor named Case Bola, a world-renowned scholar in the field of comparative mythology. He spoke to us and we hung on his every word. And during our discussion, 
One student in the class said something like this, said, you know, help me understand Greek religion. I can't, I can't wrap my mind around the informality between the gods and the mortals, all the jealousies and jokes and tricks and deceits and lust that goes on amongst the gods and between gods and mortals. I'm having a hard time kind of thinking of that as religion. It's nothing like my own experience of religion. That probably wasn't what he said. He probably said something like, like, so what's up with those gods anyways? And even though I can't remember the question exactly, I remember Professor Bola's answer. It was 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago to the day, but I remember it like it was yesterday. He smiled and he said in his charming Dutch accent, religion is too serious for it to be solemn. Religion is too serious for it to be solemn. It's an idea that stays with me. It's an idea I find in Anne Sexton's poem where she imagines God in an unconventional, almost sacrilegious way, cheating, cheating at a hand of poker. But somehow this God who is playful and surprising is more alive, more real than any deadly serious deity could possibly be. Dearest dealer, I with my royal straight flush love you so for your wild card that untamable, eternal, gut-driven ha-ha and lucky love. Let me repeat those words that Franklin said at the very beginning of the service. He said, many native traditions held clowns and tricksters as essential to any contact with the sacred. People could not pray until they had laughed because laughter opens and frees from rigid preconception. A theology of play would instruct us to play as a means of opening ourselves up to revelation and ushering in the transformation that is so necessary for the growth of our souls. Carl Jung said, the creation of something new is not accomplished by the intellect, but by the play instinct. Jesus, while he doesn't really fit the description of an archetypal trickster god, not saying Jesus is not like Coyote or Crow or Cocopelli or Loki, but I definitely think we do see in Jesus a willingness to break out of the stifling solemnity and anxiety that keeps people stuck. In the Gospel of Mark, there's a story about Jesus and the disciples walking through a cornfield on the Sabbath. They're, they're hungry, and a couple of the disciples pause to pick ears of corn. And this act draws the ire of the Pharisees. They challenge Jesus, saying, what you're doing is forbidden on the Sabbath. You're breaking the rules. And Jesus' answer reveals a playful attitude towards life. Jesus' answer goes like this. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. What he's saying is that the purpose of life is not to follow rules. When the rules get in the way of life, break them. The rules exist to serve us. We don't exist to serve the rules. It's the answer Jesus gives. The rules exist to serve us. We don't exist to serve them. Those are the lessons of this morning. Laughter frees us, liberates us from rigid preconception. The sacred comes through upset and reversal and surprise. The play instinct creates something new. The relationship between anxiety and seriousness is so predictable that the absence of playfulness in any institution is almost always a clue to the degree of its emotional regression. I'd like to conclude by applying a few of these ideas about play to our life together in community. And I want to say, first of all, that playfulness is not against our theology. Sometimes it seems to me Unitarian Universalism has a reputation for being kind of overly earnest, cerebral, staid, but there's nothing in our DNA, in our genetic makeup, that is against playfulness. In fact, our slogans, we need not think alike to love alike, love beyond belief, deeds not creeds, devotion not dogma, Establish that at our core, what we're about, we're about relationships, not rules. At our core, we're about relationships, not rules. If the rules get in the way of us being in relationship together, break them. If the rules get in the way of us being in relationship together, don't, 
sacrifice the relationship, change the rules. At the end of the day, our success as a people is measured by the quality and the depths of the relationships we form. And connection and closeness and relationship is diminished by reptilian seriousness. It's only possible through mammalian joyfulness and playfulness, right? We liberate ourselves when we put what strengthens relationships on the front burner and put everything else on the back burner. Is what we're doing helping us to form better relationships? Are we making room for the new through play? What would that look like in our life together? What would that look like in coffee hour or during a book discussion group or a religious education class? What would that look like at your committee meeting? What does it look like when we show up at a protest or serve the community? What does it look like when we sing and worship together? So I want us to challenge us to play together more in this coming year. Start meetings with a humorous reading or even better, a pillow fight. <laughs> my, friend, my friend Jake Morrill, who uh, um, preached at my installation last January, he has an annual pillow fight in his congregation. <laughs> Just an idea to put out there. <laughs> Promote your committee by wearing silly hats or garish accessories. Have your committee meeting at Paper Hand Puppets and conduct all your business during the intermission. <laughs> Hold your brainstorming retreat at a, the miniature golf course. I actually once went, um, once went to a committee meeting at a, at a college basketball game and we did all the business at halftime. And then we enjoyed the game. It's best, best committee meeting I've ever had. <laughs> this doesn't only apply to church, by the way. Take this to your work or your classes, your neighborhood, your residential community, your dorm. Take it to your family. And I know some of the couples who are sitting here today, you're, you're giving each other looks. You know, I, I don't I want to say who, but you know that one of you is more serious than the other. True? True, I see some nods. The playful one is grinning at this suggestion. The more serious one is not liking this suggestion at all. I say, let the, let the more playful one decide what you're going to do this afternoon or the next date night. I want to leave you with, with one last story before I close. Back when I lived in Kansas, um, we had to put up um, with this really, really hate-filled person named uh, Fred Phelps who used to go and and protest in this very just hateful way. Down the road from, from my church, there was a high school, a local, a local high school that had elected its first ever gay prom king. This was Kansas, which means Fred Phelps was going to show up to protest. The students from that high school and neighboring high schools and the GLBT-friendly organizations planned a counter-protest. So on one side of the street, there were the five members of the Phelps family holding ugly, vicious signs. And on the other side of the street, 500 youth wearing bright rainbow colors, glittery, dazzling, goofing, clowning, hugging, laughing. One youth walks to the very front directly across the street and unveil. I mean, there were all sorts of signs, you know, some appropriate and, and some less appropriate, all joyful, and unveiled a sign that read simply, we're having more fun than you are. <laughs> this is a statement of fact, undeniable. It was also, it was also a theological statement. The side with the students was the side of growth, of liberation, of relationship. It was the side of life. The other side was joyless and rigid and, rigid and inflexible. It was the side of extinction, the side of death. Play is not unimportant or trivial. Play is life. Where there's play, there is hope. Where there's play, there is future. Play is what saves us. 
Choose life and choose play. Amen.